I represent here Ashanti Development uh, as a charity based in the Jetia and Suta near Mampong in the Ashanti region of Ghana. We work in a deforested area of a small rural villages in the savannah, providing water, sanitation, healthcare, income generation. So, Professor Teye, let's start with the first question which is the object of your studies. To what extent climate change has been forcing people to migration in the African continent? And if you can then focus on the Sahel and the northern region of Ghana. Thank you so much for the question. So migration is not new. Migration has been occurring for several years and people have always uh, moved uh, in relation to changes to the climate and the climate change in recent years have contributed to migration from the Sahel and from the dry areas in particular of Ghana and some of the West African countries. Uh, the reason being that the rainfall regimes have changed in recent years, so it's not raining as it used to be. And so therefore people in northern part of Ghana, people in Burkina Faso, people in Niger and Mali are likely to move. In Ghana, for instance, we have seen people move from the north to the Bronx, the half of region where they can farm. Uh, they used to do this seasonally in the past, but some of our studies have shown that even those who used to adopt seasonal migration are now uh, moving more permanently because the rainfall regimes have worsened in some cases. And so migration is one of the ways by which people adapt to changes in the climate. The other ways people could adapt to changes in the climate, which has to do with irrigation, for instance, is sometimes not feasible in some of the communities because they don't have dams. So more and more people from the Sahel region of West Africa are moving downwards for a better climate where they can farm and where they can organize their economic activities. We will not say the migration is the sole factor driving, we will not say climate change is the sole factor driving migration, but we can say that climate change is interacting with other factors such as population growth, such as the unavailability of jobs, such as weak capacity, to adapt to climate change. Yeah, so which kind of people uh, used to migrate? From uh, what part of the Sahel? What kind of a population? Most of the migrants have been males and then the youth. And so usually the male and the youth will migrate, thereby leaving behind women. They migrate seasonally. And the parts that are highly affected with the, the Mali, Burkina Faso, Chad area, uh, northern Nigeria, part of Cameroon, or even we could say the what we call the Chad Basin. The Chad Basin has experienced, you know, the Lake Chad itself has dried up in recent years. And so a lot of people that used to be farmers or fishermen around Lake Chad have had to move. So it has contributed to out migration. When in the past, it was mainly the youth and the males that were migrating. In recent years, we have also seen increasing number of independent women also migrating. So, for instance, Northern Ghana has been seeing increasing number of young women moving to Accra and Kumasi. And this is also linked, in a sense, to climate change because there were a lot of jobs that they have to do on the farms. And while those jobs are no more bringing the necessary income because of climate change, they are also moving. So it used to be male dominated, but we are increasingly also seeing young women also migrating. Let me be quick to add that it's not only due to the climate change, but also social change, because in the past, it was difficult for women to move, but as a result of social change and maybe uh, changing uh, norms and values and also inability of men to look after their wives, some of our studies, the men said they used to have control over their women. They used to control them to see they shouldn't migrate. But now it's becoming economically challenging for them to 
do everything for their wives. So the wife choose to migrate and there is nothing they can do. Then we also have young women that now because of social network, they have contact with people in surfing uh, Ghana or surfing uh, towns in West Africa. And so they are able to move to those places. Mr. Steye, uh, according to your knowledge and to your studies, this kind of a migration will increase in the course of the years and how this kind of a migration will affect the relationship between people, the changement in the society, and also how it will affect the resources. Yes, so we can look at the effects of the migration in two ways. First will be its effects in the receiving areas. And the receiving areas, we are talking about the urban areas and then also the places in the forest zone where migrants go to. And so uh, in some cases, in the urban areas, let me start with that, the migration to urban centers is contributing to the emergence of slums or what we call informal on plan settlements because most migrants that are coming from the rural areas are poor and they arrive in the urban centers and they have no place to stay. So if you come to cities in Lagos, uh, uh, cities in Nigeria such as Lagos, uh, in Accra, we're likely to have more slums emerging uh, because you are going to have more people moving to these places. Now the slums are not well planned. so access to water, access to electricity and other basic necessities will continue to be a challenge if we don't plan for these people that are arriving in the cities. They have some type of crashes with city authorities because of that, so slam eviction. For instance, we in Ghana, we saw people were evicted from old Fadama and you do know that majority of these people were coming from northern Ghana, for instance. And so if we don't plan very well, that is what we are going to see in the urban areas. In the forest zones, that used to receive a lot of migrants from the arid regions. Uh, what we are likely to see if we don't work very well to address it is we are going to see increasing crashes sometime between the migrants and host community. So in some places, the migrants have been living as settler farmers for a long time. And more and more migrants are moving to some of those places. It means we are going to have crashes over resources, especially land, for instance, is going to be a problem. We have even seen, for instance, still, uh, like the migration of the Fulani is also partly attributed to climate change because they have to move with their animals while they are not getting uh, the grazing land. And so while they move, we've seen in the Agogo area and some parts of Ghana where they are crashing with the people that are farmers in those areas. And all these things can be attributed to climate change. So what we do need to deal with some of these things is to plan very well to try to see how we are going to ensure that people that are migrating to these regions have access to resources without necessarily disturbing the already uh, living environment of the people that are living there. If this is not done, we're going to have some of these crashes. Cases of those crashes have been reported in part of Nigeria, part of Mali, part of Burkina Faso, where we have had migrants moving to settle in new environments that the natives also think that they are competing with them over their resources. In the Chad Basin of uh, the Sahel, we've seen a lot of crashes uh, between uh, different groups of land uses. So the hunters, the farmers, the herdsmen uh, continue to crash over the water bodies and all over grazing land and over other resources. If the males have migrated, leaving behind the women, and they are not remitting them, then the women are forced to take additional responsibilities, which is difficult for them to take. So sometimes males have migrated, living behind women, and the women have to struggle to find resources. In some cases, the males are able to send remittances, uh, both cash and food back home. So that provides some resources to, for improved livelihoods. But in other cases, people have moved to urban Ghana and they have maybe remarried or they have left behind their families and they are not remitting them. And then that is a, 
a problem for uh, livelihoods back home. So all we need to do is to find policies that we ensure that when people migrate, we don't have some of these uh, problems coming out. By the way, uh, about finding a solution uh, for better policies to address these problems. In Ghana, there is cooperation between politics, academics, scientists to solve this problem, to address these problems. We have a national migration policy uh, which was uh, formulated by my colleagues uh, Mariama Wumbela, and we also have a labor migration policy which we have formulated. I was the lead consultant for that. All these policies have talked about the need to manage migration very well to ensure that we harness the benefits of migration and also deal with the challenges. So if you take the national migration policy, for instance, there's a session on climate change and migration and what needs to be done. So these policies are usually written based on the academic findings that we have. I will not say that all our academic findings are always being used, but I think if you compare with other countries in the West African region, I think in Ghana there is a relatively high level of cooperation between the academics and the policy makers, especially in the area of migration and climate change. I will not say it is perfect. I think mean, there is more room for improvement because there are a lot of findings that are on the shelves that are not being used to influence policy or that are not being used to develop strategies. But we have begun working with uh, policy makers, uh, at least in the drafting of these policies. What needs to be done is the implementation of the policies that have been drafted. So we have a climate change policy, we have a national migration policy, we have a national labor migration policy. Uh, we have it done very well as far as the implementation is concerned. Uh, so that is one area that we are lacking, but I think more work will need to be done to translate the fine tuning policies into action. The policies I've talked about what we call facilitated migration. You know, sometimes people have seen migration as only negative, something that has to be stopped. And we cannot stop migration, people will continue to move. So what you need to do is to rather educate people so that they make informed decisions about migration, where to go. For example, if you are talking about resources, uh, resource scarcity in destination areas, it will be good to educate people that are migrating from maybe the upper west region or upper east region, areas that they can go. But yet sometimes policymakers want to restrict migration because we think when people come to the urban area, they create more problems. So what we rather do is you facilitate migration, you plan. So for instance, in the slums, are you going to upgrade the slums? If you upgrade the slum, but take it out well, if we evict them, they will go back to their uh, their origins. It's not going to work that way. So all over in Africa, there has been little attention to a facilitation of migration. Most of the time, what African governments want to do is to restrict rural urban migration. But we don't think that is the way to solve the problem. People will still move. So you need to rather facilitate safe and orderly migration by providing information to would be migrants in make informed decisions. Uh, in the country, there are areas where we have vast lands and vast resources. How do we engage chiefs in those destination areas so that when migrants come there, they don't disturb them? All these things are things that you will need to do together, the academics and the policy makers. And the media, like your, the NGOs, like your organization, we all need to be on board to ensure that yeah. we harness the benefits of migration. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's go back to the discussion we had been doing uh, before with the next uh, question. In the future, uh, which part of the population and uh, where uh, will be more affected by climate change and how these will affect the levels of poverty? Yeah, so uh, we, if you look at the climate change scenarios, you realize that temperatures have been increasing. Uh, in the whole of uh, West African subject region. And in Ghana, those temperatures have been increasing and we 
expect this to continue. Rainfall regimes have also been fluctuating. Uh, so in some areas, we have seen declining rainfall. In some areas, we have seen increased rainfall. But the overall outlook shows that we continue to have uh, what we call frustration in rainfall regimes. And these tend to affect farmex the more. In West Africa, we have weak adaptive capacity in the sense that as a result of poverty, many farmers are not able to adapt to climate change. The forms of adaptation include irrigation, as I've talked already, uh, the use of maybe improved seed variety. So if you have seed variety that will grow for about four or five months, you need to have about two or three months so that even if the rainfall regime is not good, uh, that the, that seed can do well. Then you have to also move to all farm uh, employment opportunities. But in West Africa, we don't have a lot of all farm employment uh, opportunities. In many places, it is only farming that people can undertake. And a little bit of people can also involve themselves in trading. And so when you are talking about all farm activities or other forms of what we call in situ adaptation, adaptation that will not involve migration. It is not sustainable in some communities, especially in the dry areas. So we are talking again, parts of Northern Ghana. In Northern Ghana, uh, the western, the upper west region is one of the areas, the upper east region, these are areas that are seriously affected uh, by climate change. And then I've talked already about Mali, I've talked already about Niger, I've talked already about part of Chad. So these areas will continue to be affected and the people that will be affected mostly are the farmers. Now farmers are not going to be affected at the same level. Uh, we will have gender differences still of women and children being more affected because usually the youth and the males are likely to continue to migrate. And if they migrate and they leave people behind and they are not able to send a lot of remittances, then this is going to worsen the already poverty situation. So if it is not well planned to facilitate migration, poverty is likely to increase in the Sahel region in particular. In fact, unfortunately, this is the same region that is facing a lot of conflicts, right? Forced displacements and other things as a result of uh, activities of religious extremists. And so if you combine the religious extremist activities uh, with the uh, climate change, which is going to worsen if it is not well planned, then it means that poverty is likely to increase in some of these two regions. We have not also done very well as far as the protection of the environment is concerned. People are falling down tracing discriminatory in these regions. Uh, people are setting fire to the bush. So all these things continue to contribute to the worsening climate change situation in these areas. And this is what we need to do more to in order to ensure that climate change is reduced. But what about the Ashanti region? This area and the rural area of Ashanti region is ready to welcome all these people? That is a very useful question. One thing I want to mention over here is even though the climate change is affecting more of the Sahel region and more of the dry region, the forest transition zones are also experiencing some level of, uh, we will not say climate change, but variability where rainfalls are not coming on the time. And so even in the Ashanti region, in the Western region, in the Eastern region, there is a new research uh, we are doing uh, with colleagues from Denmark. And when we have done the climate change scenario, we've seen that temperatures are also increasing even in the Ashanti region even in uh, western region, even in eastern region, although the rainfall regimes are still better, which is why people continue to move there. Now, we, as more people move to these regions, the Ashanti region, the western region, the eastern region, then it means that we're likely to have more crashes over resources. And that is where planning for uh, effective resource use regimes are required. If the Ashanti region cannot continue, or the Western region, not all the places cannot continue to just see an influx of a lot of migrants without planning for these migrants. So especially in the urban areas, as we have seen in Accra, we've also seen parts of Kumasi where 
slums have developed as a result of the influx of uh, migrants, especially from rural areas. So then we also, as a region, need better planning mechanisms to ensure that people that move to the city in terms of housing, water, electricity, they have adequate. So I was looking, uh, I was watching the TV the other time for reason, I seen how the uh, Wabi Dam for reason people are building close to the dam, destroying it and all those things. They are all part of increase in the population of the region and this is due to both natural increase as a result of high birth rate, but also migration, rural urban migration. So as you have more people moving to Ashanti region, you also need more effective planning, especially to deal with the emergence of slums. And then even in farming areas where we have a lot of cocoa farms, where we have a lot of other farms and migrants are moving to those places, you need better mechanisms to ensure that you don't have conflicts between the, the migrants and the host communities. So these are things that we need all over Ghana, not only in Ashanti region, but in Ashanti region, where a lot of people are moving to, we need it. Now it's not only Ghanaians, we see people from Niger, people from Mali, people from Burkina Faso, in Kumasi, also in Accra, we need to have good planning systems uh, to ensure that all these people get maybe adequate housing, they are well uh, uh, protected and all those things. And also we need mechanisms to ensure that we don't have conflicts between the migrants and the natives. This is very important. The natives should be made to know that the migrants are there to pursue livelihoods and that is very good. And it's good to receive them, you know, they are Africans. And even so we have for West Africa, we have the Afri West African Free Movement Protocol that allow people to move from any region to another. So sometimes the natives are not aware of these protocols that our government have signed, but it's good also to receive migrants. Sometimes migrants are also contributing to socio-economic development of our countries, and we have to know that. If you look at the cocoa zone, for instance, the production of cocoa has always been facilitated by migrant labor. If you read the work of Amano and some of the works you are doing with DIPIT, you realize that even as the native own children have migrated from rural areas to urban areas, we are migrants from North Ghana, migrants from Niger, migrants from others going to Ashanti region, going to Western region, going to Cote d'Ivoire. If you look at the mm -hmm. production of Ghana, cocoa production in Cote d'Ivoire, it has always been supported by migrant labor. So it is important to get the priest and the natives understand that migration is not bad at all. Receiving migrants is part of promotion of migration. Sometimes some migrants have also been able to invest. You have lands there that are unoccupied in Ashanti region, in Western region, and we need migrant labor sometimes to work on some of this land. So migration can be well managed to increase production, even in the Ashanti region, in some of the regions where cash crops are produced. Climate change will also affect the cultivation, right? So do you think uh, there will be crops which will disappear with the time how the agricultural sector, especially in the rural villages, can deal with this issue? So that is a very good question. Yeah, so uh, that is why I started by even saying that even in the forest zone, there are areas where climate change is affecting the production of, let's say, cocoa. So if you, in our study in the eastern region, the grow area we've seen, increase in production of vegetables, for instance, in areas that used to produce cocoa, but the cocoa trees, some of them uh, have uh, been destroyed by climate change or let's say high temperatures and inadequate rainfall. Uh, so again, in, even in rural areas outside uh, the Ashanti or outside the forest zone, uh, there has already been emergence of new crops as a result of I would now see environmental change. So here, declining rainfall is one, increasing temperature is one, uh, declining soil quality is one because the soil quality uh, has also reduced. And so new crops have emerged. 
I grew up in a rural area in the eastern region. It's called Anyukwa. We used to produce plantain and cocoa yam in those days when we were young. Today, we see them producing things that we didn't produce in those days, so garden egg, pepper, and other vegetables. All because the forest zone is gone. They are no more receiving the rainfall they used to receive. The top soil quality has declined. So they are producing crops that they uh, can use just small quantity of rainfall. And also these are crops that they have to cultivate using fertilizer and other things, which in the past we were not using. So new crops are likely to emerge, uh, and then also new crop varieties. Uh, the Ministry of Agriculture has already been doing well. It's part of the Climate Change Adaptation Program for Ghana, whereby new crop varieties are sometimes developed. If you are talking about maize, for instance, several new varieties have emerged. If you are talking about pepper, if you are talking about tomato, with varieties that are more resistant to drought are being uh, produced. And so once people are likely to use these varieties, it's a form of adaptation to climate change. But we are going to see areas where crops that were not produced in the past are going to be produced. For instance, in areas that used to be forested, where only plantains and tree crops were produced. These days, those tree crops are not doing well because of the declining rainfall regimes. And that means that even in those areas, people are going to see the emergence of new crops that are drought resistant. And that is what we think is going to be the situation in the near future. Mm -hmm. Some problems with the environment are provoked by human beings, that by the activity of human beings. For example, the uh, deforestation, that is a big, big uh, problem. Uh, but it seems that there are not enough control eh? uh, and there is no punishment. Deforestation is a very serious problem uh, facing Ghana and facing other West African countries. And so when you are talking about the forest zone of Ghana, deforestation is one of the causes of the climate change we are experiencing. In fact, the work was done as early as uh, 1995 by Horton and Abuja. They look at the condition of the forest reserves in Ghana. And it will interest you to know that the their reports show that only 2% of reserves in Ghana were in good condition at that time. That is in excellent condition. So some of them were partly degraded. Some were even totally degraded. That is even forest reserves. And now outside reserves, even though the Forestry Department or the Forestry Commission, uh, the, it has laws to protect the forest. It's been very difficult for them to protect our forest. So some assessments have shown that we've seen increasing uh, deforestation. So more than 80% of the forest cover uh, has been depleted, in, if you look at it in some senses. Uh, some have been converted into secondary forest. And so we have illegal logging going on over there. We have bush uh, fires. We have farming activities even in reserved forest. And yes, you are right to say that the control mechanisms have not been effective. Uh, part of it has been the case of uh, increased population growth. So people are in areas, they don't have farming lands and they have to farm on forest and they have been trip uh, planting programs, but they have not been well implemented. Uh, we have also have bushfires. People set fire to the bush because they are looking for animals, rodents, uh, bush meat that also goes on. And so I mean, also if you are talking about even population growth uh, and housing, so part of the forest have been destroyed sometimes to build houses. So it is not controlled at all. And it is the reason why we are also having uh, climate change. Uh, it's not only in Ashanti region, Western region, uh, Central region, and all parts of Ghana where we have some forests are facing serious deforestation. There have been three planting programs, uh, but they've not been adequate. It, they've not been well implemented again. So the forestry department sometimes they lack the resources. 
uh, Santa, they lack the manpower to enforce their rules. You also have a high level of corruption. And so sometimes you can have forest guards that also sometimes collect money from illegal chainsaw operators and allow them to operate. When I was doing my PhD study uh, on forestry in Ghana, I realized that sometimes uh, you even have forest guards that are assisting people in some of the communities to fell down trees in the night and they allow them to farm it on the forest land and they pay something to them because of social network between them and then the people. So all these things account for deforestation. Are the measures taken till now by the international community sufficient to deal with this massive problem and to slow down the climate change and its effect? Yes, yeah, so the international communities have been community, they've been supportive uh, in dealing with climate change or let me say environmental change. If you take for this time, we have have a number of programs that have been implemented with support from the World Bank and the European Union and uh, others. Uh, I, they are doing their best, but the West African governments or African governments also need to do more than they are doing currently. In my view, uh, the international community, well, you can't have the 100% performance, but as far as the provision of uh, the uh, financial resources is concerned, they are doing far better than African governments are themselves doing. So if we want to see progress, we have to be more serious. Communities, we have to be more serious. Because think of it this way. If you are talking about deforestation, Sometimes it's happening in communities where there are chiefs, where there are assemblymen, where there are local people. And so if somebody is in Europe, somebody is in America, and they are sending us money to implement effective environmental protection programs, we will not achieve a lot if we ourselves are not serious. So sometimes money has been received even by African governments or West African government, and they have given it to institutions to manage climate change, to manage environmental change in general. And sometimes the money has even been uh, used wrongly. We have had a lot of corruption in West Africa. So we can say that international organizations can do more, but we can also say that our people also need to do more. African governments themselves, tree planting, how many governments are taking tree planting seriously? How many governments are resourcing their forestry departments to be able to protect the forest? How many governments are enhancing the capacity of farmers to be able to undertake climate start, smart agriculture? How many governments are doing all those things? Sometimes money is provided for climate smart agriculture and all these things. But the money sometimes goes to politicians and it is sometimes misused all over Africa. We are seeing scenarios where even things that are purchased to be used by farmers uh, is not only related to climate change, even tractors and other things have been hijacked by uh, uh, politicians. So these are some of the things that we will need to work on. So in brief, the international community is doing quite well. They can do more, especially in terms of resources and also technical support. But we cannot achieve anything if African government themselves and we as citizens do not support them because if we get resources and we mismanage the resources then we are not going to uh, get anything out of those resources so these are some of the things that we need to do i hope you don't mind if i ask some suggestion for the activity we have been doing in the ashanti region as ashanti development so uh, I was telling you that we, we are based in uh, Jetiasen Suta near Mampong, and uh, we work in a deforested area of small rural villages. And uh, we provide water, sanitation, health care, income generation, many, many activities. We not long time the effect of climate change. So my question is, is it sensible for us to drill boreholes in our area? Yes, that is very sensible and that is a very good decision. So the groundwater supply 
is good in many parts of the forest zone in particular. And groundwater is really uh, one of the ways that we can deal with the climate change and shortage of water. So I think it is very good for you to drill boreholes in as many areas or many communities as possible. Because that is the sure solution for dealing with the uh, water scarcity problems. In fact, water scarcity is one of the major problems, especially in some of the communities in Ghana. So I think that is a very good uh, decision. Drilling of boreholes, especially mechanized boreholes, can uh, help transport water to many parts of the country. But even if they are not mechanized, simple boreholes in communities, very useful, very good idea. And I think that is something that you can do. Large numbers of migrants are now moving in our area, specifically in the rural area of Ashanti region uh, in a Mampong area. And these uh, create uh, the, the, the farming too difficult, you know, even for the local people. So this is, uh, this is having an impact on the local farming resources and local population. So which are the perspective for the future, according to your knowledge? These people, as you said, will continue to move and migrate, but this will impact the resources of the, um, of the area. Yes, yeah, so we, this is an issue that many migrant receiving communities are facing. Uh, so migrants continue to move to those areas because they think that the soil is fertile, they think they have networks there, but the local communities sometimes are also impacted because sometimes they have scarce uh, land, the land over there is scarce, and so when you have migrants moving in there, there's competition over lands. And that is why we have always been talking about facilitation of migration, even from the origin. So if there are proper mechanisms to facilitate migration, areas that have already received a lot of migrants, it means the migrants moving, we have information that some of these areas, uh, they already don't have existing land. And so they can move to areas where there are more land. But even if they do arrive in areas that already have a lot of migrants, a better resource planning regime can help to ensure peaceful coexistence between migrants and the, the natives. So one of the ways sometimes you have vast land that is not used because of our land tenure system. Sometimes the land is controlled by traditional authorities and the local people might think they are not having access to the land and the traditional authorities are selling the lands to the migrants. So sometimes it's not the case that there is no land. The traditional authorities in some communities may want to sell lands, expensive to, uh, lands to the migrants. And then it means the local people will not have access to the land that they need for farming. But if there is more planning, there's more engagement with the traditional authorities, they'll find ways of ensuring that natives have their share of access to land. And that means natives are also able to undertake their agricultural activities, even as migrants. There will also need to be some time engagement between the natives and the migrants. So sometimes you have some activities of migrants that are alien to the natives, maybe their culture, and do you have crashes as a result of those uh, crashes in the culture and all these things. We mean more engagement between migrants and the local people and sometimes NGOs have worked in this area where they have facilitated what you call cross-cultural communication between migrants and then the natives. Maybe sometimes they have organized their best to highlight the contribution of migrants, for instance, to also let migrants know that if you are in their land, you have to respect their laws, maybe their bylaws, and all those things are all things that we can do together to ensure that migrants and local people uh, coexist peacefully. So it's not easy once there are people coming there, it means the resources will be under pressure, that we need more engagement, more planning, more discussion to see how resources can be allocated very well uh, uh, to both migrants and also to the natives. Because natives are not happy if migrants are giving all the best, the fertile lands, 
and they are cultivating crops and they the natives do not have access to so these are things that achieve traditional authorities have to work with ngos have to work with government officials sometimes to address all these issues the last question uh, is uh, is there any way of finding out more about the destinations of the migrant flows for example are more of most of them settling near of us near us i mean you know mampong the indian region or are many settling to the east west or south this information will uh, enable us to plan better for um, for any move uh, we may take in the future migration destinations all over ghana is quite dispersed uh, it depends on what the migrants intends doing so the young women that are migrating for instance are settling in the urban areas in Kumasi, so the core urban areas where you have activities going on are uh, where we have the young people. Now, the young men that are a little bit educated are also moving to the urban areas. But then the farmers are moving, obviously, to the Mapo areas that we have talked about. We've also seen a, a lot of migrant moving towards the Ubuasi area, where apart from some of them, uh taking part or engaging in mining activities some of them also go into farming so uh where cocoa is produced to the areas where cocoa is produced to we tend to have more migrants in the cocoa producing areas in the ashanti region simply because the migrants always are looking for farmland so apart from the map areas all the cocoa growing zones are areas where we have a lot of settler farmers, settler farmers from Volta region, from Eastern region, from the Krubo area, from northern Ghana. So it's not only northern Ghana that people are moving from to Ashanti region, from the other regions too. But as I said, you may want to concentrate not only in the farming communities, also in some of the urban uh, slums where we do have migrants that are in the informal sector. So uh, you may want to concentrate on the Mampon area, the cocoa growing areas fine, uh, the mining communities, and then also some of the urban slums. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing with us your knowledge, uh, for helping us to understand more about these issues. Your work is really, really precious. We appreciate it so much. Let me thank you so much too for the good work that you are doing. Uh, NGOs like your organization are really, really helping African government to do a lot of things. Uh, and we appreciate you for all these things that you are doing. Anytime you need to have discussion with us, we are always available at the Center for Migration Studies, University of Ghana, to continue the discussion. How the climate change has been affecting the population and livelihood of the population living in the Sahel? Let's talk about that part of the country because many, many people come from that part of the, of the country in other regions of the West African country and how it affects the northern Ghana and how this is provoking the increasing of migration. Okay, thank you. So uh, climate change and uh, climate variability um, has been increasing in magnitude. Um, way back in the 70s, in the 1970s, already there were issues of climate variability and uh, people's uh, inability uh, to cope with this. There, but then, way into the 1990s, then we find uh, bigger changes in climate systems, not just variability, but then the whole climate system has uh, more or less shifted. Now, what are some of the issues with climate change? How is it manifesting itself? It's manifesting itself in uh, how it affects rain-fed agriculture. So it manifests itself in terms of uh, droughts, it manifests itself in terms of flooding, too much rain, it manifests itself in some years, if you look at the quantity of rainfall, everything is fine, but then 
you have uh, lots of um, short spells, short droughts in between of sometimes up to three weeks without rain and that is enough to destroy um, uh, agriculture because there isn't this very, the whole of Ghana is 3% uh, irrigation. So that means that if you have any disruption with the rainfall, then it goes to affect agricultural livelihoods. Um, now, uh, flooding, which uh, people often look at as a disaster, right, uh, performs two negative impacts. So one is the fact that floods destroy agriculture, which is the source of livelihood, and floods destroy homes and people's assets that they have built over several years. So I talked about the dry spells, or what we call short droughts, right? Um, I think in Ghana we have had uh, not too many bigger droughts as we have in the Sahel. Uh, you remember the bushfires in 1979, 1981, some 1983, right? Those were the major droughts. Um, since then, I think we've only had minor droughts, not big ones. Uh, but still, uh, what happens is that the investments in agriculture now are higher than in the 1970s. So it means that it, um, people live on loans today. So if you have a small drought, it's enough not only to take away your farm output, but to put you in debt for a much longer time to come. Now, you talked about trends in terms of migration. How does this feed into migration? So you have the Sahelian countries, which are above northern Ghana, that are having huge problems with their agriculture, and whose urban economies and non-farm economies are not big enough to absorb the farmers and the uh, herders, cattle rares, right, into their urban economies. And therefore, we are having uh, migrations into Ghana, which is relatively wetter than the Sahelian countries of Burkina Faso, Niger and Mali. So then we have migrations of those populations in here. Uh, though their governments have been much more serious with irrigation, Burkina Faso probably has much, probably more than 10 times more irrigation than Ghana. But uh, even with that still, um, migration is inevitable. The north of Ghana has had a huge Fulani population from the 1980s. And now, uh, as a result of education of children, many people who have cows, especially chiefs and politicians, are using Fulani to take care of their cows. So that is one dimension of migration, though uh, in the literature, the herders often sometimes are not considered as migrants, but as people who are uh, moving in between landscapes. But this has become a permanent thing, that they actually move down to look for jobs in taking care of people's cattle. Now, you take northern Ghana itself, because of climate change, you have had livelihoods, agricultural livelihoods have become precarious. They are not reliable. And the poverty is endemic in farming communities. And where climate change uh, combines with uh, less land, less possibility of expanding your farm, then it means that it will trigger uh, urbanization. But beyond that, of course, um, Migration in Ghana um, is also as a result of the fact that you have had more urban opportunities since uh, the mid-1980s. Opportunities in urban Ghana have increased dramatically in terms of people being able to provide services, right? so finding a job in what we call in the informal economy. So the informal economy is beginning to also pull, act as a pull factor for migrants from farming communities. Because people have to weigh between what is what, what is happening to us to our agriculture, right? Climate change, reducing yields, uh, bad years, um, uh, animals, right? Problems of keeping animals. I think what helped in the 1970s when it came to climate change in the 1970s for rural communities was that they had substantial amount of livestock. So therefore, if crops fail, they will still buy cereals coming from. The south, coming from especially the, the transition zone uh, around uh, Techiman, Kentampo, those were excellent places for growing of maize in the 1970s. So as a result, you will still have food to eat because you have livestock. But today, livestock numbers have plummeted because of problems of keeping livestock. 
because of the collapse of veterinary services which have become privatized, right? So as a result, climate change begins to bite. So if you look at the climate change in itself, it's not an enough trigger of migration. You need other things. Your inability to survive a climate disaster makes you want to move. But if you have other things that will cushion you, such as assets that you can dispose of to buy food, people would still stay in, in spite of the problems of climate change. People would be able to adapt by building better houses. People probably would, whole communities might be willing to move to higher ground to avoid flooding, right? But because assets are low, this is not happening. So, uh, can we say that climate change is also going to change the human geography of some territories? And how uh, to deal with this uh, changement? Yes, so, um, I mean, uh, already the, the landscape, the, the human geography we are seeing, right, that we even had we probably in the 70s, we already defined by climate change way back. So you are, if you look at the history of various uh, tribes that have relocated, it has either been climate change or war. These two things have, you know, uh, led to the location of many of the tribes we have in Ghana, in present-day Ghana. Of course, we are not likely to see the same uh, mass relocation. What we now see is that climate change certainly is creating, first of all, an urban world relocation. And Ghana is today is 51% or 52% urban. And probably we are one of the few in sub-Saharan Africa where our urban population has passed rural population compared to East Africa, for instance, or, or, or Central Africa. We are one of those where urban population is growing huge because agriculture is losing that magnet and also, but also because of government policy, which is pushing the service sector very high and then of course also uh, some industrialization at the same time. So basically you find that you now are having tribes from the north northern part of Ghana disperse right and diffuse into the rest of the country much more. You find few of people in climate in favorable climate zones in climate stress zones. So you will not find many Ghans or many Ashantis in Bolga, Tanga, uh, or in rural Bolga, uh, Upper East region. Certainly you will find movement of people from the south to urban areas in the north because of bigger economic, urban economic opportunities, but not to rural areas because of certainly the unattractiveness of agriculture as a result of our inability to move into irrigation, which would have created a level playground whereby you will have the, uh, a, a kind of a balance in terms of movement. But right now we don't have a balance. We have much more moving downwards to more favorable areas and less people moving up or people moving up are going to only cities, right? And they would be people who have much more capital. So basically urbanization is happening rapidly. Rural areas are getting depopulated. As a result, we are also having larger farms People are beginning to grow bigger farms because people are not there to farm. People are moving away. So it's given opportunity for, some, for many farmers to upscale their farms. Also, one of the reasons why people have bigger farms is because of climate change. That if the smaller farms that used to be very productive are no longer productive, their productivity has gone down. So now you need a bigger area to be able to compensate. And you have strategies such as uh, um, planting in badges. So, if you need a five acres to survive, you do 15 acres because you are not growing, the, you are not sowing at the same time. So, because of climate change, if you lose five acres, you still have 10 acres. So, in some way, you already answered this question, but on which extent migration has been changing the structure of a Ghanaian's population? And which are the good and the wrong aspects of this contamination between? different trials. Yeah. So um, you find out that um, if you take the isn't a real empirical evidence to this, but then we it's anecdotal that migration uh, in countries or regions where you have migration 
of different tribes and mix them up, they have tended to be less conflict than places where you have homogeneous populations. Because then the sense of identity and not knowing the other is a huge problem. But then where there is a lot of mixing, people get to know each other. And we have always used the evidence from our secondary schools. You know, Ghana started with uh, boarding secondary schools from 1960s all through. We were building boarding secondary schools. And then the boarding school, they sent people from different places, different regions to the school. So then we begin to know each other and we know people as Philip or Joseph or that, right? We don't know them as Ashanti or Kasela or the Gomba. So then when those guys grow up, it becomes difficult to engage in, in, in a conflict because we know that these are just people, right? And they, everyone thinks differently and, they, and we act similarly. But so, what about from people and tribes coming from other countries, yes. from the Sahel, for example? Uh, yes. Ah, so we have, we have had. You see, it's difficult to say, to point out a relationship between migration and conflict. Very difficult. But I think that we are looking, in my hypothesizing, I always think of thresholds. I think that where you have got migrants, when the population, the receiving population, considers migrants as useful, you never have any problem. But when the receiving population thinks that the level of migrants has exceeded some threshold, then that is where you begin to have issues. And for the Ghanaian situation, if we take Tamale, I grew up in Tamale, we have received lots of Moshi from Burkina Faso since as a kid from 1970s. There has been Moshi people coming in. And everyone in Tamale like the Moshi people. Right? They want to give them their daughters to marry, they give them land to farm. The Moshis have been good herbalists, right? Treating sicknesses, terrible sicknesses. They have got antidotes to all that. The Moshis have had uh, very good trading skills that they are willing to share with local people, right? Um, some have come with lots of capital and have established businesses that have helped the, the, uh, the communities. So as a result, everyone, and as uh, now, if you go, no one in Tamale would say I'm in Moshi. They say I'm the Gomba. No one says I'm in Moshi. But they are all Moshis, right? Over, over time. However, Fulani has been a different story. But we have to understand the nature of activity. So we find out that when migrants move in and they uh, perform similar activities and perform new rules that the resident population find useful, you have no issues. But when migrants come in and people feel some negative externality, such as crops being destroyed, right? Um, such as um, people building extreme wealth whilst they, don't, they are not able to make anything then we begin to have animosity. An example of uh, migration, which is not climate related, is the Fumbisi Valley. Fumbisi Valley in the, uh, in the Bulsa South of Upper East Region, where there are valleys, fast valleys, and then you have rich people from all over Ghana going to farm rice. People go and farm rice, 500 acres, 1,000 acres, right? The people are happy when they come in, right? But then, after two, three years, when they see them loading lots of rice and huge ejaculators, then they are not happy anymore, right? So you have that, that situation. But that is rather a situation where people are going to make use of agriculture, which the local people can make use of because you need bulldozers, you need tractors or chains, you need crawlers to be able to operate such a farm. That is something that indigenous people don't have. What they have is valley from God, that's all. You know, so there certainly there's always happiness, bitterness, happiness, bitterness, you know, that is a trade. But in terms of international migrants, the story is quite different because it looks like in the case of Fulani, we've had bad experiences. In the case of Moshi, we've had good experiences. But it's also because the Moshi migrants are fewer and they don't come on mass. The Fulani might come on mass and that is a problem, you know, for in the, in the perception of people. Let's focus now on the Ashanti region yeah. and the contamination which is happening in the Ashanti region mm -hmm. in the rural areas mm -hmm. and uh, also what are nowadays the struggles in terms of uh, lands, resources, mm -hmm. 
climate change and the capacity of people to adapt to these, these circumstances. Yeah, yeah so in the Ashanti region, the story, climate change is also, of course, beginning to bite, though we consider Ashanti region to be a favorable climate zone. But then uh, I mean, the, our research with cocoa farmers has shown uh, problems with cocoa farming um, as a result of climate change. Uh, we are seeing, of course, uh, land scarcity in Ashanti region because of years since uh, 1930s. They have been receiving migrants from the north, from Burkina Faso, from Mali, right from Togo to cocoa farms. And uh, there is some saturation. So that means that land has become a huge problem. And the politics of land in Ghana is serious. And migrants would often be caught up in this battle between uh, land owners, between family heads, and the youth. And that is a very dangerous uh, situation that is emerging in, in Ashanti region. So we've had changes in the contractual agreements between migrants, especially, on cocoa farms. And as you know, Ashanti region, eastern region, western region, cocoa farms and oil palm farms uh, form the majority in those areas. Now, some of these contractual uh, problems that we are beginning to have have to do with how much uh, the migrants are entitled to at the end of the cocoa harvest season, which is beginning to become problematic because uh, most farmers are not ordering the those. We have a share cropping system, and the share cropping system means that a farmer, a northern farmer, for instance, for example, takes a farm and crops it, and then after three, four years, they are supposed to share the farm into two. Now, as a result of uh, scarcity of land, as a result of uh, resistance from the children, the youth of the farmers, right, these agreements often fall into loss of chaotic situations. And that is destroying the harmony, right, of the farming systems that have been created around the cocoa industry all these years. Uh, beyond that are also uh, new uh, crops that migrants are interested in. So in the Western region, I've discovered that now many people who used to migrate down to farm on cocoa farms are beginning to go into rice because you have lots of small valleys everywhere. And a rice, one acre rice, gives you more money than one acre cocoa. So then, but you have indigenous people who cannot grow rice because they are not they don't know, they don't have the skills to grow rice, right? And now, so you have landowners and chiefs giving out these lands which are yeah, not usable lands, and you have new people making use of these lands, and which is also creating tension, right, now in those areas. DRI represents a charity, mm -hmm. which is called Ashanti Development, okay. and we work in the Jetiase, Suta, mm -hmm. Mampong so that, yeah. area. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, this way, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, my question is this now. Which suggestion you will give to our charity how to carry out agricultural and development project in the best way, taking in account migration? So I think in guiding your work in the Mampong area, uh, you would have to be strategic based on um, what you intend to achieve at the end of the day. Um, uh, Consider the fact that the society is differentiated into migrants, indigenous, poor, rich farmers, and you are interested in agriculture. Um, I would think that if you were to go for the category of farmer, right, um, you should be able to have a cross section of people who will fall into that. If I were you, I would first probably want to do a survey in order to determine how I select beneficiaries for the project and uh, you do a survey based on the fact of what you already know about what should be in the place so that you kind of segregate beneficiaries in your project to fit the, the diversity that you expect because uh, depending on where you go projects can easily be hijacked by just one group of people so you, you really need that survey to give you the best eye view of who is here, who is involved in agriculture, and what kind of support you want to go in for. So though we know that there are land problems between when it comes to migrants and indigents, but the fact that people are already farming tells you that 
they have already partitioned themselves up. It's now up to you to make sure that you have a diversified group of participants, right, in your list, so that at the end of the day you don't just go for one group. Two is you will, you will have to find out what kind of problems exist, right, maybe between the small farmers and big farmers, uh, between the commercial crops like cocoa, right, and oil palm, and maize, and plantain, and maybe cocoa yams, right, and then you tell yourself, okay, here again, what is your objective? If your NGO is more about food security, right, your objective might be more towards the food crops. If your NGO thinks like the World Bank, and you are thinking of how do you upscale the wealth of the community, which would also benefit uh, the, uh, the value chains up, then you will be thinking of, let's go more value, a high value crops like oil palm, like uh, cocoa, like rubber. So it means that you have to look at the philosophy that you have. That is very important. And that philosophy would guide what you do. Now also on the type of assistance you want to give. If you decide to go cocoa, right, then you have to ask yourself, what are the issues affecting the cocoa uh, industry today? And those issues will be climate change. How is climate change affecting the cocoa industry? It's affecting it through pests, the type of pests, pests that are now invading cocoa, you know, plants. You also have uh, farm control measures that you have the um, Cocoa Research Institute. They have excellent uh, strategies of how to deal with, I mean, uh, farm operations today in the era of climate change, but yet the uh, research is not being disseminated. So what can your NGO do to get that research out there so that the farmers benefit from that? Because you might not have that, ex that expertise. If you decided to go food crops, what has happened to the food crop sector, right? You have the same crop research institute with wonderful maces, right? That can increase food security two, three times, right? But farmers, are not confident in those seeds or farmers are not able to adopt them because they probably have to have some four parts of fertilizer per acre which they cannot afford. What intervention does an NGO put in place in that case? Right? Another area is climate data. What kind of you can decide to intervene in terms of climate data services, right? What do farmers really need to navigate climate change? They need to know when are we having rains. Are we expecting a drought, a short drought this year or not? Then you have data for Mampong area, right? And these guys generate the data for you, and you can work with, say, uh, FM stations in the area, you can work with extension people there in the area, or if your NGO is big enough, it means you yourselves are able to also meet farmers, right? Or even send text messages or apps to be able to disseminate that information. So. There are several things you can do, but you cannot do all the things. So you have to select, you know, based on your philosophy, right? And then you have to make sure that diversity is important. You need to have migrants, indigents, different tribes, small farmers, right? Or if your focus is small farmers, you just go small farmers. Some people want to have medium and big farmers, which now, first I didn't support that, but now I support that. You know why? Because when you leave, some big farmer or medium farmer can still continue your method. And then small farmers are able to still, you know, see value in it. But in many instances, when the interventions are based on only small farmers, and it's, uh, it's a form of a subsidy, once you leave and the subsidy vanishes, everything ceases. But medium scale farms are able to still continue your intervention. And when you come back 10 years, you are happy that, oh, what I told them is still there. Right? And it benefits the small scale farmers. So you have to really say balance in that. Yeah. So thank you so much, uh, yeah, Director. Yes, thank you. <laughs>